So welcome to the Dodger Game Channel. You're watching a Mormon Truth video. This is going to be about magic and Mormonism. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and uh, the magical history that has basically been really suppressed by the church for many years. Uh, sometimes people hear some of these things from sources that are considered... Uh, uh, suspect or something like that. I've even seen videos on the internet. I saw one that was actually a really good factual video, but the the title was, you know, really lousy. It said like Mormons are satanic, and uh, you know, that's pretty ridiculous as far as your average church member goes. Um, I'm not defending the Luciferian leaders at the top, but uh, your average member of the church is. Is certainly not uh, thinking of that they're just trying to have a happy family and make it a forever family but I'm gonna document some things here because that's the way to do things is to document it it's it's not a bunch of made-up stuff or something you know that somebody just came up with some Ed Decker story or something you know that he sold to the evangelical Christian community so they could be good anti-mormon spiritual warriors or something that's uh it's something that was actually accepted, uh, you know, Joseph Smith's day. Brigham Young openly talked about uh, using, you know, magic, magic charms and things like that. Brigham wore a bloodstone as a magical charm, basically, for protection. And that's pretty well documented. What was, his, is it, was it his daughter? Well, look at some of these things. You know, they, they, he got, this, this was a historic uh, one. It came from, like, Captain Cook and... It was even used to heal somebody. But what, right now we're looking at the uh, seer stone that is uh, said to be the one that Joseph Smith supposedly put in his hat and uh, pulled the uh, seer stone in the hat business as far as uh, many things, actually. Uh, but uh, translating the Book of Mormon is the kind of the famous one. And yeah, this is First Presidency Vault picture you know they the church finally let the well the cat was out of the bag so now they're trying to look like hey we were transparent about it the whole time oh <laughs> sure yeah that's why nobody knew about it recently they did in the early days joseph f smith said that joseph uh, smith used this stone in his hat for basically channeling the Book of Mormon. He wasn't looking at any old golden plates that weren't even in the room half the time, according to Emma or David Whitmer, you know. So, um, you probably, you may have heard these things, you may not. But let's go. Let's get into some history here, and uh, I'll just show some of the, some of the mass amount that's, do, uh, that's documented here, including from Richard Bushman, Patriarch Bushman, you know, who wrote Rough Stone Rolling about Joseph Smith. He was trying to write something that looked a little kinder and gentler towards Joseph Smith and his reputation than what Fawn Brody had written. Niece of President David O. McKay, who got excommunicated and bad mouth, especially by BYU professor and apologist Hugh Nibley, who's a... Uh, <clears throat> the king of character assassination and passed the baton on to uh, Dan Peterson. Yeah, so let's let, let's get into this. So Joseph Smith started off about uh, 13 years old, getting involved in magic, from what I have read. His uh, neighbor neighbor girl was into uh, using her seer stone, and these were really popular back then. Uh, Joseph Smith had more than one. This is the most famous one, but there, there was a, like a clear one and so forth. And it's, like I said, it's, it's pretty well documented, so we're going to cruise through some of those things. Let me just do a little narrative now. So we borrowed this girl's seer stone. So they work like a crystal ball, basically, but you put them in a hat, and then they start glowing. Does that look like it glows? It doesn't look like it's glowing to me, but uh, throw it in the hat, and I guess uh, that's when the magic starts. If, if, if it's been, you know, set apart, dedicated... That sort of a thing. That reminds me of the <laughs> fact that maybe I'll just throw that in here too. The the practices of the occult, you know, witchcraft, Freemasonry, you know, high level Freemasonry, um, you know, which is proclaimed to be Luciferian by the leaders of you know Freemasonry, your most acclaimed leader ever, Albert Pike, 
who helped found the KKK, by the way, I believe, and the Palladian Rite of Freemasonry, which is pretty, which said to be openly, you know, satanic. Um, yeah, he said they need to harness the seething energies of Lucifer, at least if you're a master mason and or above, and, uh, yeah, pay attention to the pure light of Lucifer, the Luciferian doctrine. That's what Manly P. Hall also teaches. So they're both like 33rd degree Freemasons and, and occultists and that sort of a thing. So, uh, you know, Pike was like head of the Supreme Council for, you know, southern jurisdiction of the United States. He was a Confederate general, if you don't know. And Yeah, anyway, uh, so... Witchcraft, Freemasonry, magic, they have language characteristics, just like, you know, uh, various, uh, ver various, uh, mm, I don't know what I want to say, uh, groups, religions, uh, you know, uh, anyway, uh, so, keys, keys. Joseph possessed certain keys by which he could discern things um, invisible to the you know natural eye. Said his mother and said others. This is why uh, these these are words that uh, were spoken, I believe, in connection with Josiah Stoll coming 150 miles from where he lived just to find Joseph Smith because he was known to possess certain keys by which he could yeah, see things in the unseen world. So he, uh, keys, and the seer stone he used was a big part of this, a key. Um, a seer stone is set apart or dedicated like graves or uh, people receiving priesthood callings in the church are set apart. These are magical terms. Degrees, the three degrees of glory in the celestial kingdom, that's Masonic, everything has they are all degrees, you know. It could be a 32nd degree Freemason or maybe even make it to the 33rd. This is Scottish Rite though, pretty much. And Joseph Smith was in the York Rite. Um, degrees, set apart, dedicated, uh, the order of Melchizedek. You can make some of these things you'll find in the in the scriptures, but they're magic. You know the order of Melchizedek. Oh, that that's Freemasonry. You'll you read up on Royal Arch Freemasonry, and I put some of that into one of the videos. There's a lot of terminology there that's awfully familiar within the Doctrine and Covenants, and sometimes within the Temple or Relief Society. Some of the language that's used. Maybe I'll just mention as I go along. Go along here and make a list of magical or Freemasonic terms that are used within the church. So um, Joseph Smith got involved with the uh, Seer Stone, and, and they were digging the the well there at uh, William Chase's Willard Chase's house, and that's where this stone came from. Apparently, if we got the right stone. And he, Joseph threw it in his hat, and it worked, and he borrowed it. Then Willard wanted it back, because he liked using seer stones, too, but Joseph wouldn't give it back. And there's a, there's a quote in there somewhere, you know, I uh, said, I don't care what the devil you have to say, you'll, you'll, you shall not have it back. So, he had quite a reputation. There were interviews with his mother, you know, we're going to go over there, that, when she said, hey... We weren't totally lazy and didn't devote all our time to the faculty of ABRAC and drawing magic circles and all that stuff. I mean, you know, we never neglected one important thing for another. We did our, we did our farm work or whatever, uh, but we attended to the spiritual needs for the soul. <laughs> magic is a spiritual need for the soul. Yeah. Okay, so he had a reputation. He was just a boy. He got involved with this. And uh, this gal's got a really nice website, Dyla, 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 Eve out of the garden, yeah, 
Right, so we got some quotes there with Brigham Young. He's talking about, you know, Joseph Smith told the Quorum of the Twelve that everybody should have a seer stoned, but most of them are kept from it from by wickedness. And uh, many people use seer stones for wicked purposes. And, uh, you know, what, I wanted to be kind of chronological there, but I think I'll just talk on inspiration from the things we come up with when I go through this stuff. And uh, so Joseph Smith was still into the magic arts. Uh, of course, you know, we'll talk about the Jupiter talisman. That was a magic charm, basically, that he carried, which is related to his uh, astrological alignment and was supposed to give him power and persuasion, protection, and uh, especially with women. Fancy that. So, uh, anyway, yeah, Brigham said that, uh, that Joseph said these things, and, and what we do know is that uh, Joseph Smith received a lot of revelations, he said, on his seer stone. Some of the Doctrine and Covenants revelations came from the stone. And, uh, you know, Hiram Page was a friend of Joseph Smith. The, the Page family were, you know, friends with Joseph Smith. And uh, uh, there are various references. Hiram Page wound up having a, a seer stone. And he started receiving revelations. Uh, evidently, other people in the church were starting to follow his revelations. So Joseph came up with a revelation that said, only I get revelations for the whole church on seer stones. You don't. Uh, another good point was when uh, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery fled to Canada for about five weeks after uh, the Kirtland Anti-Banking Safety Society, which was it's supposed to be a bank, but they couldn't get a charter, so they just changed, you know, changed the, the, the print there on what they're printing out to, to say something different than bank, Anti-Banking Safety Society, but it folded. A lot of sketchy stuff involved with the details that I'm not going to get into there, but they uh, split the scene, as you might have said in the 70s or late 60s. They hightailed it out of there, and when they came back five weeks later, Rigdon and uh, Joseph, half the church was now following a girl, I believe she was 16 years old, who had a seer stone, was receiving revelation. So a seer stone is basically like a crystal ball, but they're a little smaller and not always clear like a crystal you can't always find that so anyway I read about how you dedicate them or consecrate them it's you know it's magic and you know you got to be facing a certain direction and say certain magic spell words and all that kind of stuff and uh, yeah pretty interesting so uh, half the church was following it a girl with a seer stone including the three witnesses yeah the three witnesses uh, they were all following this girl. So Joseph Smith's pretty charismatic. He got got a lot of the people back in line following him after that. But uh, the uh, folks, you know, his followers were uh, were feeling like this was a credible way to receive revelation. It was on a seer stone. Three witnesses were so inspired that they were the ones who chose the quorum of the twelve. They, they selected the apostles. Here you don't know it, unlike the New Testament story where Jesus decides to get things started and he goes out and he picks twelve apostles. That's not how it happened with the church. Um, when Joseph Smith formed the Church of Christ, he was ordained the first elder and Oliver Cowdery the second elder, and they kept it that way for a while. So it was first and second elder. So they, they just kind of expanded all, all along the way. A few years later, I'm thinking it might have been as late as 1835 is when they did the 12 apostles. But I, 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 not, I don't want to be quoted on that. Anyway, it wasn't at the beginning. So the, they got the 12 apostles, and, and the, it, that was something done by the the three witnesses, meaning the three guys that said they sort of kind of saw an angel with their spiritual eyes. When, when Martin Harris was questioned by the printer, he said, did you really see it like with your natural eyes? And he denied it. He said, no, no, I saw it with my spiritual eyes. It may not be an imperfect quote there, but 
and I'm not looking for that one right now, but we look it up. It's pretty much what they all said. Um, and again, I guess we got like all those signatures for the other people on one generic thing. I think Calvary signed them all for the other eight witnesses. So it wasn't exactly like, you know, product testimonials where everybody's got their own thing to say and then signs it. It was like one generic thing written and Cowdery signed it. Plus that, like, you know, they were basically from about three families, most of them. You know, Whitmer's and then other or related to Joseph Smith. You know, Cowdery was just like a cousin. Not, not a first cousin, but he was a cousin. Okay, so anyway. Joseph Smith, so he gets involved and he got pretty famous because he could find people's like lost chickens or whatever. I don't know, with a seer stone and then they went out, were doing the digging. This is just digging the well when he got it. But they were, you know, digging for treasure, for, you know, thinking like Captain Kidd or somebody, buried treasure. And that's when we get into the necromancy. In other words, the treasures they were seeking at night on these things where Joseph Smith was the seer. Um, and, and he was kind of getting trained by another seer in the in the Innie area for a while. And, uh, well, they we had guardian spirits that they said, like, you know, pirate ghost stuff. They were guarding the treasures. They'd, they'd hit something, they said, oh, it's the treasure chest. And then it would slip deeper into the earth. So they'd, they'd draw magic circles with magic knives and then, you know, slit the throat of a sheep or a goat or something or a dog as long as it was black usually and uh walking around the circle till it bled to death and sacrifice it to the guardian demons so that's pretty demonic basically sounding so the church wants to call this folk magic maybe it sounds like black magic to me black animals and if you're the animal <laughs> it's a uh, pretty unhappy situation Okay, moving right along here. Oh, by the way, Joseph Fielding Smith authenticates this too. Um, not only the Seer Stone business, but other issues with this. Oh, is that some Joseph Fielding Smith stuff right there? Josiah Stoll. Let's get into that. Okay, so in 1826. Now, if you think about the, you know, the first vision story, the popular one that he kind of made up, at the, you know, many years later, it said God the Father was there, and that he was, you know, that it was only in, that he was only 14. It was 1820, which is not consistent with, you know, the other three to eight versions, depending on if it, you know, ones directly from Joseph Smith or somebody else relating it. They are never including God the Father, and he was always older, like you know, 15, 16, 17, whatever. Basically, 17 as far as all of his family said. William, his brother, who was an apostle in the church, has four different interviews recorded, which I've done on other videos on the First Vision. All of them saying that Joseph Smith got started with religion in 1823. That's when the family started attending religious revival stuff, it says. And they joined the Presbyterian Church after Alvin died in 1823. What he died in what, about 19th of November? That sounds like a little late for revivals. That would have been when the weather's warmer. So, maybe, maybe they joined Presbyterian Church in, you know, early 1824. I don't know. So, uh, what are we reading about here? Hmm. Gift of seeing with a stone. All right, it was a gift from God. Oh, that's according to the question. He's trying to twist this. Bushman basically tries to make it sound like God was preparing Joseph Smith to be like a, a, a seer, like a prophet and seer, you know, holy guy, by practicing magic. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't really go along with what it says in Isaiah, you know, wizards of peep and mutter, but that's what he said. He tried to just put the spin on it, you know. I met with the Twelve. Yeah, okay, so then there, there they are, the Twelve. They're talking about his seer stone stuff and getting revelations. For section 130, the Doctrine and Covenants basically says that everybody else receive a white stone that will be a urim and thumb to them so they can get revelations about higher worlds, you know. Section 130. Same kind of a theme. Of course, it's written in the Book of Mormon. There's spectacles in uh, you know, Ether Chapter 3 prepared so that ancient languages can be translated. 
But in Alma, we're talking about a stone that glowed. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I searched more, found Brigham Young, wore a stone around his neck. Okay, that's the bloodstone for Captain Cook and all that stuff. We've got, there's loads of documentation on this. Captain Cook had this, and Brigham got it, and had miraculous powers. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, when so so Joseph was digging, not digging, he was not the digger. Josiah still came, 150 miles pound, and fired his former seer, scryer, or whatever, crystal gazer. Hired Joseph Smith, and they never got any treasure on his property, so pretty soon his nephews got upset and took Joseph Smith to court, 1826. This is what all the Christians say. Joseph Smith was a convicted con man. Well, what do they charge him, like 23 cents or something for court costs? I don't know. But uh, he didn't get in a whole lot of trouble, but um, Josiah still defended him. He said, ah, he was doing a great job with the seer stone. We, you know, we hit the treasure box once or twice, but it slipped deeper into the earth because of the demons. Joseph Smith wore a talisman, Jupiter talisman. He was wearing it when he got shot. Apparently it didn't work well enough. He needed temple garments. He needed magic underwear, but he didn't have it, I guess. I don't know. Reed Durham apparently found the, oh, okay, yeah, Reed Durham, so he was a church historian, and he talked about the talisman, like a dialogue, you know, general Mormon thought, or Sunstone or something, and that Mormon historical society, he said a little bit too much, he thought it was a masonry or something, but it, it's all about magic, which is in masonry, maybe he was just a little ignorant. Pissed off Spencer Kimball, and he made him, you know, put a statement, you know, saying that he believed the church was true anyway, or something. Yeah, there it was. Reed Durham, Spencer Kimball. Spencer was not happy. I think I heard he was a Freemason, but can't prove it. Okay. Ooh, are we going to talk about the treasure cave in Camorra here that Oliver Cowdery and Brigham Young talked about? Oh, in the cave. Yeah, so they said they had like golden plates piled up to the roof and stuff. Yeah, these are actually documented stuff. As far as, uh, not that the cave is documented, but these stories, I mean, they, you find them and people are supposedly credible, you know, in church history. Talking about them. The magic cave in Kumora. All kinds of golden plates in it. Amazing. I could just get this to stay here. Okay. Why am I having trouble with this? Uh, oh well. I'm not going to worry about that. Move it. On to the next thing. Alright, so we took him to court. How about when Joseph Smith gets kicked out of the Methodist Church in 1828? You never heard of that one? He wasn't baptized in the church, but he tried to join their Sunday school. Of course. We all know that later on we had that story that said the, 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 the now popular God the Father and Jesus version of the first vision with him being 14 says that the Lord told him to not, go not after them. They're all corrupt. There's Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and everybody else. So immediately Joseph's hanging out with a Methodist minister and tells him this stuff and then they all persecute him. Of course it doesn't go along with the story of his family seeking comfort by going to religious services in 1823 after uh, Alvin died because all these people would have been persecuting Joseph and hating him so that wouldn't have been very comforting I don't think but he didn't pay attention to those things when he made that story up neither did he you know plus, plus he said it all happened in 1820 and there that they joined the Presbyterian Church in 1820 it's pretty well established even by his mom and brothers that that happened in 1823 ish or, or just after then. So, what do you got here? More about the digging. So, they, so he gets kicked out. He joins their Sunday school, and these people, I think they were even relatives of Emma's side, I think. Kicked him out, said they didn't want a, a necromancer disgracing their church. So he couldn't even hang out with their Sunday school. I mean, maybe he's trying to practice being a preacher, I don't know. All right, the Knight family, Newell K. Knight, Joseph Knight. These guys were Joseph Smith's friends. You know, this isn't like slander made up by Christians or something. 
Okay, directly away, neither to lay it down. Oh, this is the instructions about when he's supposed to get the plates from the spirit that was guiding him, which later in the story becomes, it becomes Moroni later, I think like after Joseph Smith was dead. He did make references to a guardian spirit, and his name was Nephi, not, not Moroni. Anyway, Joseph Knight talks about it, so he had all these little stipulations. Well, you know, if you go to the hill, and if you remember the story I've told before, I mean, like, Moroni supposedly comes to him, you know, that's why we got it now. Tells him his sins are forgiven, but then the next day when he goes to the hill, he tells him, no, you haven't kept the commandments, so you can't have them. Just keep coming back every year, but if you read other accounts, he's talking about, okay, well, it says, okay, you have to bring Alvin. Yeah. Well, sorry, Alvin's dead. So, oh, well, you gotta bring Emma, but you gotta, you know, be dressed in black, and she's gotta be dressed in black, and have a black horse and a black carriage, and blah, blah, you know, all kinds of magic stuff. At midnight on the equinox, all kinds of witchcraft stuff, you know. Um, yeah, so, like September 22nd or something. What did he practice? Did, did he, I, I bet he pra I published the Book of Mormon, like, the spring equinox, Mark, late Mark. Um... So these are his friends, you know, it's not like somebody weird made these up. They're, and his friends talk about, you know, their family. There's the Jupiter talisman, magic talismans he used. Right there. Magic Jupiter talisman. So when you see this, sometimes these Christians put that on there. And, yeah, they didn't make it up, actually. Emma Smith sold that to the church, I guess. Right, here's Bushman talking about Joseph Smith's reputation again. And, uh, yeah, necromancy. He had the reputation go on. He was a magician. Graham Young was into it. As, as far as the, you know, using the bloodstones and stuff, there's a magic parchment. So, like, like I said, Bushman's totally, well, he's a patriarch, okay? He tries to make it sound good, but it, you know, Joseph Smith was a magician. End of story. Everything faded to black. Salt Lake Temple, if you look closely at the spires, you know, each one of those six big columns there. We want to call columns or spires. They've all got 13 spires on them. 13. You know, and you, you see the inverted pentagrams and stuff on the Nauvoo Temple and the all-seeing eye. And, you know, I always try to come up with these excuses, but sorry, people. There's so much occult stuff in the architecture. You just don't know what you're looking for. Yeah, here's the nice fake pictures they give us with Joseph with his magic glasses on looking. He didn't use magic glasses. He This is what he they say he did, not that. Yeah, you know, not not looking at it like that, but he had this face in the hat. See that? That's totally fake. No nerds cartoon. Well, not like they had cameras anyway. So tons of documented stuff. You can do your own reading. That was a great site there. Uh, Eve out of the garden. Lots of documented stuff there. Read Durham. Totally, you know, high reputation of Mormon. Um, researcher, historian. Uh, it's just the church decided to cover this stuff up. So they put the, you know, brown rock, you know, in, this, in the first presidency vault. And now it's coming out because there's so much out. And you know, basically, South, South Park is the church's biggest problem uh, on that level because they put so much, so many people saw that that the church has to basically come out and go, okay, yeah, we got the rock. I'm sure we probably published something about it once. Yeah. So years and years after he was, would have supposedly seen God the Father after he came up with that story, he's practicing magic. Yeah. And trying to join the Methodist Church. I mean, none of these things add up to his story. Why is he trying to join the Methodist Church? Why was he talking to a Methodist preacher about his vision? Why is he practicing magic and gets prosecuted for it six years after he would have seen God the Father and known he shouldn't be a magician? Why 
Why was he telling Book of Mormon stories before he ever had the plates? Read his history by Lucy Mack, his mom. She's talking about his wild imagination and telling about, you know, the, the, the Nephites, the Lamanites, or whatever, you know. The, they may not have used those words, but the American Indians, I mean, it gets pretty entertaining sometimes. Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview by D. Michael Quinn. He's probably got a lot of good info. Dan Vogel. He's a pretty good researcher, I think. Well, it's for real, people. Your prophet was a magician. Abra Kadabra, the, the uh, faculty of Abrac. That's where that comes from. His own mama said so. His daddy used a uh, divining rod, as did Oliver Cowdery. Scryer, seer, crystal gazer, it's like crystal ball. It's magic. And if they call it folk magic, it sounds better than black magic, doesn't it? When you're sacrificing animals, that's pretty bad. It's almost as bad as being... Jewish. They massacred even more animals. At least they did. We saw it on the Dodger Game channel. Like, subscribe, make some good comments. Thanks.